Hello and welcome to Walker and Dunlop's webinar on financing and the commercial real estate market. I'm Susan Weber, your moderator for today. Before we get started, I have a few tips to enhance your webinar experience. Um, please, uh, below the presentation, there'll be some tabs you can use. And now I would like to welcome Willie Walker and his guest, Dr. Peter Linneman, who will discuss the commercial real estate markets, the impact of COVID-19 and ideas for moving forward. Thank you for joining us, and now I will turn over the call to Willie. Thanks, Susan, and uh, good morning to all of you in Western time zones, and good afternoon to all of you on the East Coast. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased that so many of you could join us uh, today. Um, I think we have over 4,000 people on the line, and so thank you for taking the time to join Peter and me. I would like to thank Peter personally for um, accepting my invitation to come on. Uh, as many of you know, Peter has been an incredible leader in the commercial real estate space for decades, um, not only as a renowned professor at the Wharton School, uh, but since founding Linneman Associates um, after uh, leaving Wharton. And I would put forth to all of you, if there's anybody out there who does not receive the Linneman letter, uh, it is a quarterly update on the commercial real estate industry, and I would strongly um, uh, encourage any of you who don't get it today to get it because it is insightful and you will hear from Peter later on exactly why it is so insightful. Um, I also want to wish everyone um, safety and health at these uh, concerning times. Um, I would put forth that everyone on this call, obviously with over 4,000 people, I have no idea um, the financial wherewithal with everybody on the line, but generally speaking, everyone on this line is safe. Generally speaking, everyone on this line is not forced uh, to be in a place where they are susceptible to catching the virus right now. And everybody on this line can pay their either rent payment or their home payment at the end of this month. There are millions of Americans who are not in that position today. And I'd like to first start by saying those first responders and people on the front lines and hospitals across the country who are taking care of the sick, those people who are providing essential services across the country are the true heroes at this time. Uh, and I would only say to everybody on this line that in any way that all of us can help support those people, we ought to. Um, this is when people's true character is shown, and there are many people who are scared at this point in um, our history, and anything we can do to make them a little bit more at ease and be able to get through these times will go a long way. Um, I would also say, um, please cherish this time with your families. I am certain as... Um, my family, after being in our house for the past couple of weeks, um, tensions can clearly get a little tight. And at the same time, these are unique times. Um, I was thinking back yesterday that I have not seen an airport for 15 days. Um, that's the first time in 30 years of my professional career that I have not walked into an airport on a weekly basis, much less over a two-week period. Um, let's find the silver lining in these difficult times and uh, enjoy the time that we're having with our family. and. Um, try to put everything and keep it all in perspective. Um, the final thing is, um, on a personal note, um, let's make sure that we're checking in with our teams and having the permission to feel. Um, I think it's extremely important at these times. We started our executive meeting yesterday morning at WND, and I went around the horn on our Zoom call, and I didn't ask everyone to jump right on the issue of the day. There were plenty, but I asked everyone how they were feeling. And not just I'm good or I'm tired, but are you stressed? Are you concerned? Um, are you um, excited? And we had a really engaging, honestly, 15 to 20 minute discussion on just that before we actually got to the business of the times. So as all of us are in this distributed model today, I would strongly encourage any of you who are meeting with teams to not only communicate, but really communicate about what's on your mind and what you're dealing with. So I wanna jump into a couple things for the next 10 or 15 minutes. I'm then going to turn it over to Peter. He's going to share his thoughts on the markets uh, and what he is seeing, and then we're going to go through um, a laundry list of questions that have been sent into the two of us. Um, I want to start with um, testing uh, because um, I'm going to get to talking about the financial response to this crisis, um, but I must say that testing has been the most concerning and the most disappointing um, outcome problem that we have faced since this crisis hit us. Um, just to run back through the timeline, the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in the United States was a resident in Seattle who returned from China, and it was confirmed on January 20th. 
on February 5th, the CDC sent out 50 testing kits to labs across the country to be able to have the possibility to test 50,000 people with those kits. Those kits failed. And for the next three weeks from when they sent them out on February 5th until the end of February, nothing was done to fix that. And all testing was held at the CDC for the entire month of February. In the first week of March, the Trump administration came out and said that there will be one million tests by the end of that week. On March 15th, they came out and said that they ship materials to be able to do 1.9 million tests by the end of that week. Just yesterday, the CEOs of, of LabCorp as well as Quest Diagnostics said that the two of them, who are the two largest testing labs in the United States, will be ready to do 100,000 tests at LabCorp and 200,000 tests at Quest Diagnostics by the end of this week. So we had promises from the administration at the beginning of this month to have a million tests being done by the end of that first week. And here we are three weeks later and the two largest labs in the country have the capacity to do 100,000 and 200,000 tests. Now Roche CEO was on Squawk Box yesterday and said they have sent out 400,000 kits over the last week and that that should help tremendously. But the point being here is that until we get testing widely distributed, it is going to be impossible for this economy to get back up and going. And I know that Peter is going to talk about a model of the cost is too severe for us to shut this economy down for too long. But if President Trump is truly serious about an April 12th restart, they should have been getting those testing kits and millions of them out to the country over the last month. And the CDC should not have missed the entire month of February to have gotten testing kits both produced and distributed across the country. I equate this a little bit to fighting the Second World War and thinking about putting our troops on the beach in Normandy. This is a war. And if you think about it, if President Eisen, excuse me, President Roosevelt had said that he was going to deliver the 156,000 troops to the beaches of Normandy, and only showed up with 15,600, we not only would have lost the war, but we would have had severe death and casualties of those people, which we suffered as well with the 156,000 who did arrive. My point being is at these times, what administrations say and their leadership in a path forward is hugely important. And what I'm calling on them to do at this point is we appear to be between two camps. One is shut it all down, and the other is put it all back to work. And we seem to be in the middle ground right now, trying to distance and slow this down without having a clear plan of action on when this is gonna turn back on. And I would just say, we clearly can do this, but we clearly need leadership and a clear plan to get there. One of the ideas that Walker and Dunlop came up with and gave to the federal government 12 days ago was to convert student housing, off-campus student housing, to temporary makeshift hospital beds to help with the overflow and influx of patients into American hospitals. We went to them and said, you should master lease 50 properties across the country at 300 beds per property. If you take it at $1,000 beds, $1,000 per bed on a monthly basis, it would have cost the federal government somewhere around 160 or $170 million to master lease 50 student housing facilities to provide 15,000 beds. I went back and forth with the administration over the last two weeks, and last night it came out that FEMA is in the process of taking over hospitals and student housing properties to try and do exactly what we mentioned to them two weeks ago. The reason I raise this is we've done our own numbers on this, and I just want to run you through our modeling. So there are just over 1 million hospital beds in the United States. There are 45 to 60,000 ICU beds. So in our model, we estimated that about 10% of the total hospital capacity in America could be used for coronavirus patients. That's all the ICU beds, even though people are still having heart attacks, people are still having cancer and need immediate help. Um, but that basically gives you 100,000 beds nationwide. And we then went and looked at Fannie and Freddie's loans on student housing. And today, Fannie and Freddie have about 255,000 beds in their student housing portfolio. 
There are some exclusions there to credit facilities and other things, but generally speaking, it's somewhere around 255,000 beds. So we made some assumptions in our model. 5% of the coronavirus cases will need beds. We made another assumption that the doubling of the virus spread is every seven days. That's probably a generous calculation. And we stopped max infections at 28% of the population. Many people have talked about 40 to 50% of the population getting the virus. We capped it at 28. And we took the cases as of 3-19-20, so a couple days ago. If you run that model, in the state of California, there are 104,000 hospital beds. There are 14,000 off-campus student housing beds in Fannie and Freddie's portfolio. There are 1,057 cases as of three days ago. With a 39 million person population, that means that California needs to have the capacity to have hospital beds for 95,000 people. If you took every single one of the student housing beds in the state of California off campus in Fannie and Freddie's portfolio and repurpose them, that would only allow you to pick up 16.5% of that demand. What is really scary is as you run the model, what you will see is max hospitalization by our model, and by no means are we experts at this. We took those assumptions and ran them into modeling. The max hospitalization date in the United States will be during the week of June 26th by our modeling. And during that week by our modeling, we expect that you will need to have 672,000 hospital beds across the country to deal with the number of people who need to be hospitalized for the coronavirus. To give you a sense of what that would need as it relates to non-hospital beds, in the state of Florida, there are 75,000 hospital beds. There are 25,000 student housing beds. So if you master leased every single student housing, off-campus student housing bed in the state of Florida and Fannie and Freddie's portfolios, you would still need a third of all hospital beds to be able to deal with what we project will be a need of 51,000 590 hospital beds in the state of Florida. Behind all of this is really two really important things. One, until you look at the numbers and really focus on them, you don't realize both the velocity at which this thing is going to grow as well as the dramatic needs it's going to put on our systems. And the second thing is, if this administration and our government, when I say this administration, that sounds too political, our federal government, our state governments, our local governments, if they want to get on the front foot about this, they need to start moving immediately, as if we are at war, to start implementing a plan that shows us that we will have confidence that we're going to get on the front foot of this. Talking about certain therapeutic drugs that have been tested on 30 patients in Europe, quite honestly, is a pipe dream in comparison to what we really need, which is an action plan. So there are two models, as I mentioned previously. Some of you may have heard Bill Ackman last week on CNBC saying, shut it down for a month, tell everyone to go on vacation, and we'll get rid of this thing and we'll come back at it. And then Peter Lindemann in his podcast over the weekend talked about, if you will, a, a, a turn it on, that we're going to get to a point where the economic damage to our country is just too great for us to continue to shelter in place. Um, a couple things on that as I dive into both the response to that and how we might go down one path or the other, and then I'm gonna turn it to Peter. The first is that there are about 100 million people who are under state-imposed quarantine. Um, in the Ackman idea, shut it down, I kind of scratch my head on how you do that. Um, some of you may recall the stock market has been shut down really for an extended period of time, only two times in its history. Actually, it's three times. Back in the 1800s, one of the big, mortgage bro uh, one of the big brokerage houses collapsed and the markets closed for a couple weeks. Um, then at the beginning of World War I, they shut down the stock market for four months. That was by far the longest period of time the stock market has ever been shut down. And then on 9-11, they shut it down for three days after 9-11, and it was obviously shut down on the day of 9-11. So other than some blizzards, other than some flash crashes, the stock market has really only been shut down for an extended period of time three times in its entire life. You could do it, but what are the consequences from a liquidity standpoint, from a market functioning standpoint, and what do you say to people who owe money? What do you say to companies like Walker and Dunlop that are listed every single day, that owe debt payments to our lenders, that are receiving debt payments from our 
uh, borrowers, et cetera, et cetera. So as much as Ackman's idea sounds interesting, I just don't know how you actually implement it. The Fed and Treasury's responses have been excellent so far, I would say. Um, they have moved much more quickly than the federal government did during the 2008 great financial crisis. They have propped up the markets. And in a moment when I talk about where spreads are right now, you will see that what they have been doing has juiced a huge amount of liquidity to the markets. And the markets, thankfully, are functioning right now. Um, and as many of you also saw um, at the beginning of this week, they stepped in and started buying agency CMBS after just buying agency single family MBS last week. And then the FDIC is, has proposed insuring deposits above $250,000 to make sure that there isn't a run on the banks. The banking system is as well capitalized as we've ever seen it. And in my conversations with our bank partners over the past week, um, there is a very dramatic difference in the tenor of those conversations today than there was in October or November of 2008. So that is all very pos positive. On Capitol Hill, you've all seen the $2 trillion stimulus bill um, that is um, going to get passed. Um, interesting, it's about 10% of GDP. And lo and behold, the markets were up about 10% yesterday. Um, $1,200 to most adults, $500 to most children, a $500 billion lending program, and $150 billion straight into hospitals. Um, this is going to juice a lot of liquidity into the markets. And I look forward to hearing Peter's thoughts about how enduring this stimulus package will be. Um, from a, a CRE standpoint, diving into what is dear to the hearts of everybody on this call, um, from conversations with life company executives, um, when you have AAA corporates trading at spreads of 350 and 375 basis points, it's very hard for life insurance companies to go and put capital into commercial real estate that is an illiquid investment at anything less than a 350 or 375 basis point spread. If you add on top of that 20 to 40 basis points for an illiquidity premium, um, you're looking at pricing on lower credit commercial real estate, let's just call it triple Bs, at north of 5%. And you're looking at the very best lower leverage deals, let's call them triple A properties in the low fours. That's the clearing price right now if you want a loan from a life insurance company. They are still looking at loans on multifamily. They are still looking at loans on office. They are still looking at loans on industrial. They are not looking at loans on hospitality, and they are not looking at loans on retail. If you have a hospitality or retail asset, you need to be in to your lender now asking for forbearance until this storm passes. There is no liquidity today to refinance that loan. As it relates to the other food groups or asset classes, as I said, they are still looking very selectively. As it relates to CMBS, there are very few bids in the CMBS market today. I'll talk about CMBS spreads in a moment, but as we all know, CMBS is predicated on two things, calm interest rates, so they can price a deal today and know that they can sell it at a similar interest rate in a month or in six weeks. And the second thing is a lack of volatility. And with the VIX bumping around 50 to 65, there is really no ability for CMBS to price in this market. Banks are okay for now, as I mentioned previously. And then the mortgage REITs and specialty finance companies, as many of you know, are in real trouble. Um, we have been seeing announcements left and right this week from many of the mortgage REITs that they have had calls on their repo lines. Uh, many of them have used all of their liquidity to pay down the lines that were called last week and a number of them seem to be positioning themselves to file for Chapter 11. Um, we will see how many of them actually do it, but a number of them, I read press releases yesterday on three publicly traded uh, mortgage REITs, and it appeared to me to be that they were positioning themselves to be able to hold off on the creditors. Um, that clearly means that there will be no liquidity coming from them over the coming weeks and months likely. Um, on to multi, uh, clearly last man standing. Fannie and Freddie have been extremely active both in putting out new credit as well as implementing some significant changes to their uh, programs. Most importantly, a forbearance program from both Fannie and Freddie, which I will talk about in a second, as well as some um, reserve requirements on new loans 
um, that have required us and other lenders on the Fannie Mae side to go back and redo all of the loans that we've had under application um, after Fannie Mae came out with their reserve requirements yesterday. Um, this is a very fast moving market. Um, one day there's a need for one thing, the next day there's a need for something else. Um, I would only say to all of our clients and others on the phone that if you have a deal in hand, execute on it. I cannot tell you the number of stories I can tell you from the last week where people had a bird in the hand, they went for two in the bush, and it went away on them. If you have a deal, take it. Um, talking about pricing, um, CMBS, 10-year AAAs trading at swaps plus 325. That has come in a little bit today as the Fed has started to buy agency CMBS. On the Fannie Mae um, 10.95 dust TBAs, it's swaps plus 190. I just spoke to our desk before this call and we're actually seeing some trades at swaps plus 160. Um, that's up from 135 to 140 in mid-February. Um, and um, that's uh, up from, excuse me, that's up from mid-February of swaps plus 50 to 55. Last week it was swaps plus 110 to 115. So while we've seen some widening, it's nice to see some tightening from the swaps plus 190 at the beginning of the day today to swaps plus 160. And then the Freddie KA2 bond right now uh, is at swaps plus 130. Um, and that's up from mid-February of swaps plus 47. But nonetheless, the Freddie KA2 bond is by far the best trading that we're seeing right now. Um, two other things I'm going to talk about forbearance, and I'm going to turn it to Peter. Um, as it relates to refis, we looked into our database as far as total GSE refis in the multifamily space over the next three months. This number does not include credit facilities, single securitizations, or Freddie small balance loans, um, but this is the majority of Fannie and Freddie's outstandings. In April, they've got uh, about half a billion, 565 million coming up for refi. In May, it's 366 million, and in June, it's 557 million. So in the next three months, the agencies have a total of 167 loans for $1.5 billion coming up for refinancing. So as you're thinking about capital, the agencies do not have a huge amount of refinancings that are coming up in April, May, and June, which should allow for them to provide liquidity for other financings. My assumption would be that some of the pricing that's out there right now will start to come in as the market normalizes. But for right now, if you're one of those people who has a loan that's coming out for maturity in April, May, or June, two things. One, they're there. And two, there is not a huge amount of demand from a forced refinancing standpoint in the next three months. Finally, on forbearance, before I jump to Peter, both Fannie and Freddie have come out with forbearance programs. Um, they are markedly different. On the Freddie Mac side, you can take forbearance for a three-month period. During that period of time, you need to show distress in the property. We do not have a specific number as it relates to what your debt service coverage needs to look like to quote unquote demonstrate uh, distress. Um, but if you take that forbearance, it's that three months forbearance and during that period of time, you may not evict a tenant. After that, you owe the money back to Freddie Mac, but you have control of the property again from an eviction standpoint. And I say that, that sounds harsh in the sense of, okay, now you can turn around and evict people. I'm trying to say, as it relates to the requirement to not evict, on the Freddie Mac program, it only lasts for the three months that you're in forbearance. That is markedly different from where Fannie Mae is today. Fannie Mae, first of all, is establishing criteria that we have not seen yet, but it, I believe it will be a higher threshold as it relates to showing distress in the property. We don't know what debt service coverage number that will be, but they will tell us. We and all other dust lenders will be the ones to administer forbearance and determine whether a borrower is getting forbearance. And on the Fannie Mae program, you have three months where you may not evict, but you cannot evict tenants after the three-month forbearance program until you have repaid everything that you owed during the forbearance program. So if you're going to take a year to repay the three months that you are, not, are going to be in forbearance, you do not have the ability to evict tenants post-forbearance until you have repaid Fannie Mae. So if you are a borrower, 
and you're facing that, I would strongly suggest that before you lose control of your asset, we all know how difficult it is to get back rents from tenants and also the overall eviction process. And again, I'm not trying to say that people should be out there thinking about three months from now and evicting people, but that is one of the levers people use to make sure that people are paying them. So if you go into a Fannie forbearance and you don't plan on paying back that forbearance uh, P&I until a year out, you will be handcuffed in actually managing your asset. And I would strongly urge our borrowers to do everything they can to make payments during this period of time, to potentially dip into their pockets to make those payments so that they actually maintain control of their asset, both during these difficult times as well as after the crisis. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter. I've run on a little bit long, and so I'm hopeful that we get to some questions, but I know Peter has a lot to share with you. And so, Peter, let me turn it over to you, and um, thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Willie, and thank everyone for joining us. These are trying times, and um, uh, the, the, I've done a lot of reading, a lot of thinking, a lot of listening. The one thing I'm convinced of is no one knows. Um, very intelligent and, and dedicated people have views about the uh, immunology. Very dedicated people have views about the medical. Very dedicated people are now forming views about the business side of this or the economic side. Um, everybody was caught off guard, I think, by the immunology side of this, the medical side. And they were shocked and they asked the question, how do you stop it? And basically, people have copied the Chinese model um, and hope that it turns out pretty well. Uh, what was missed is China had a huge reported drop in their economic activity in a matter of, of months. And most of us believe the actual drop was much greater um, than the reported drop in China, given the murkiness of Chinese data. Um, economists were pretty much asleep at the wheel in terms of understanding what shutdown might mean. And I think business was so busy uh, just dealing with business that they kind of got caught off guard by how fast it shut down. Just as a backdrop, the first week of March was probably the best week in the history of the United States economy. Um, in almost any way you want to measure it. Manufacturing was a little weak, but almost any way you want to track it, unemployment, employment, uh, jobless claims, income, etc. All-time highs. Um, we were the most prosperous uh, country of any size in the history of mankind as recently as two weeks ago. Uh, we then, as you all know, shut down essentially the discretionary part of our economy. How big is that? No one knows. It all depends on how you define discretionary. I've worked bottom up and top down, and I come up with numbers like 30 to 40% of our economy is discretionary, like buying a dress at Macy's, uh, like dining out, like flying to somewhere for a holiday. You know, you know what I mean by discretionary in a generic way including, by the way, um, uh, elective surgery or elective medical or seeing a therapist or, or, or. That 40% of the economy is shut down, shut down overnight. Now, it wasn't overnight. It took about a week, but shut down overnight. Um, Vegas and Orlando each have around 300,000 people working two weeks ago in the leisure and hospitality sector, 300,000 each, roughly, I'm rounding. Basically, it's zero today, zero. If you compare that to a normal downturn, I'm just going to stay with that as an example. A normal downturn, you'd see business in Vegas drop. You'd see business in Orlando drop. How much drop? 10%, 15%? 10%, 15% meant most people still had paychecks. Most people still had something to do. And in fact, even if you lost your job in the downscaling, you could still have a hope to find a job in that sector because somebody retired. 
Somebody moved to a different city. Somebody got ill. Somebody had a baby. Today, if you've lost your job in one of those sectors, there's nowhere to go to get a job in those sectors because everybody's shut down. It's an unusual, we've never seen this kind of economic scenario before. And I'm old, uh, and I've never seen it before. So it's a complete shutdown. So if you shut down, let's say, 40% of the economy, if you shut down 90% of 40% of the economy, you're around 35% of the economy, you wiped out. That means that's an annual number, right? So then you say 35% of the economy disappears. By the way, $7 trillion, just for a number on an annual basis. If you do it for five weeks, if it only occurs for five weeks, five weeks is about 10% of a year, okay? So it's not $700 trillion, but it is $700 billion happening over that five weeks. Um, that's a huge number. That's a lot of economic activity, unprecedented. And it gives you a benchmark about how much has to go in if you're going to try to offset. I'll give you another way to view this. Um, we had about 210,000 new unemployment claims the first week of March. Tomorrow, the number is going to come out on last week. It comes out one week late. I'm expecting a number somewhere between 2 million and 6 million. I said this uh, 10 days ago, that I'm expecting a number come out 2 million, to 10 million, 2 million to 6 million. By the way, a week from now, the numbers are going to come out on this week, and I'm expecting another, an additional 2 million to 6 million, probably towards the upper end. That's a huge jump overnight. How big is that? First week of March, we had about 152 million people working, and about 5 million people wanted to work but couldn't find a job or hadn't found a job. It could, they, so it was 152 working, 5 million not that wanted to work. As we sit here today, my guess is we're around 130 million still working in the sense they're on a payroll. 130 million working and probably 27 million not working. And that's a staggering number in, in two weeks. That's all we're talking about is two weeks. And in fact, you know that some of the people who, quote, are still working are not working. They are not working. They're on a payroll. But how long can the hairdresser keep somebody on the payroll if nobody's coming in to get their hair cut? How long can the restaurateur keep somebody on a payroll if nobody's able to come in and buy? How long can Macy's keep somebody on the payroll if no one can even get there. Forget whether they buy if they got there. So it's a very dramatic situation. We have 152 million people employed uh, two weeks ago. That could easily drop by 30 to 50 million over the five subsequent weeks. So just pause and think about that number. So if you ask... Is it a very serious medical? Does it put a threat on the medical system? All those are obviously questions that I'm not the right person to ask. But I do know my, my mother uh, passed away a, a few months ago, unrelated to this, at the age of 95. Uh, she had been bedridden for seven years and had been seriously demented for about four years. And I suspect if I said to society, would you spend $7 trillion and 50 million unemployed to get my mother to live an extra day? Everybody would say, don't be ridiculous. Of course not. I mean, you love her, but of course not. Makes no sense for society. And then it's like the old joke. We now know what you are. We're just haggling over the price. And the question is, how much price is society willing to pay in terms of unemployment lost income, etc. I don't know that answer. I know that that is the question. I know it has to be on the table. I know that we could solve all traffic accident deaths, about a 1,000 a week, just under a 1,000 a week, very easily. Just never let people ever use motor vehicles. We could stop those deaths. 
but societies decided were willing to suffer more or less a thousand deaths for the benefits that it brings. And by the way, we'll figure out seat belts and speed limits and guardrails, etc. We had terrorists attack uh, many years ago on our airplanes. We did not say never fly can never fly, we put in metal detectors, and you take your shoes off. And yes, their hassle is expensive, but we found ways. My intuition tells me that within a few weeks, we've got to go from a situation of complete shutdown to not complete shutdown. And some people say, well, auto accidents aren't contagious. They are contagious. If I'm the only person on the road, it's very unlikely I'll be killed in an auto accident. It's only as others come out. Now, I'm not saying it's an exact analogy. I say that every day we live with risk. Some of them very serious. We've lived with viruses. Some of them very serious. A complete shutdown can't be the answer for very long. Can it be an answer for a while while the system girds itself? Of course, of course. We more or less shut down most of the economy from around December 20 until April 5, something like that. I just not April 5, January 5. So we can do it. Um, but there has to be something beyond. And I'll give you my last concern is not only people losing jobs, um, they're not going to pay their rent. Most people have, I think it was all number, 20% of the people have basically lived paycheck to paycheck and another 30% live month to month. That's a pretty staggering number. And yes, Congress can say they're going to give them money, but how? And it's going to take time. And what happens to them in the meantime? And all those things. There is one other concern that people don't like to say out loud. Ignore the current corona situation. Ignore it. And suppose I said to you, Willie, I just visited a country, and it had... 35% unemployment, real unemployment. And months before, everybody was employed. By the way, everybody graduating from high school, everybody graduating from college, every returning from the military, there's nobody to even interview them for jobs. You've got this whole swath of young people who not only are having a hard time finding a job, there's nobody to even interview about a job. And by the way, you're not allowed to sell your home, you're not allowed to buy your home, and you can't go get furniture and, and, and. And then I said, do you think that sounds like a breeding ground for social unrest? And I think people would say, yeah, it sounds like a breeding ground for social unrest. And the way that social unrest, and, and those of you who know me know, I'm not a panicker, quite the opposite, historically. The way that social unrest happens historically is something very small nine kids go out they had a little too much alcohol they go out they get excited they throw a trash can through a window they loot the store they have quote fun the police come the police react somebody gets hurt now the people who got hurt are incensed and it brings out more people now the protections become more extreme. Then the reaction becomes more. And every time you get a chance of social unrest, you get a chance for overreaction to social unrest. And that is a serious danger. I'm not a survivalist. I don't own a gun. I've never owned a gun. I don't have bullets. I don't have any of that. But at what point is that a serious concern? So my only comment on this is do not underestimate the cost. People aren't going to pay their rent because they don't have money. It's that simple. Now, that's not everybody, but it's going to be a lot of people. It's going to be a lot of companies. Um, there are going to be some doing it strategically. But there's going to be some saying, even if I can pay my rent, why would I pay my rent when I only have a month's worth of money? Better I have it than you, landlord, have it. And I can always figure out about settling up later. This is not just true in, in uh, this is true of the nail salon. This is true of a residential tenant. It's true of everybody. So I think the economics of this have gotten lost in the flurry of 
of the um, medical, which is very serious. So when you watch CNN or whichever you watch, they show you an ongoing tally of the number of cases. They show you the number of deaths, and that's very important. What they don't show you is, uh, imagine they had a clock that shows the lost GDP, and they show you the lost jobs in real time in the same way. And society's got more objectives than one. It has multiple objectives. And, and I think we're still in a safe zone in that another week, another two weeks, another three weeks. As it stretches up beyond that, it becomes very dangerous. Willie, I'll stop there. So, Peter, what do you think is the, what's the, what's the tipping point? So you've laid out a very compelling case as it relates to the economic damage may be more severe and cause further implications to society and the health of all of us. So what's, what's, the, what's the tipping point? Um, I, I wrote jokingly to someone over the weekend, fisticuffs on the floor of the United States Senate might be the tipping point. Um, but I mean, what's the point where you get to where you say we can't keep going down this path? And it's one of the reasons I raised the testing issue. Because if you're going to get back to saying to people, let's get back to it, the only way I would think that people resume to any kind of normalcy is if they have some kind of confidence that the people that they are interacting with aren't sick. Well, there are others. I mean, certainly testing is something that all the medical people I speak to are all for. I mean, it makes sense. It allows you to understand how, how there's a great uh, op-ed, I think, in the journal today by uh, Stanford uh, University medical guy saying, we know the numerator, we don't know the denominator. And as you get little snippets of the denominator, you can get very different pictures on death rates and infection rates and so forth. So I think testing is important. But I also think there's some simpler ways, namely, um, and, and again, this is coming off of conversations I've had with a couple of immunologists, people I've read, et cetera, which is, so we all, and I'm just giving examples. I'm, um, you want to go to work? Uh, you have to be under the age of 65. I'm 69 yesterday, all right? So I'm just making up a number. You have to be under the age of 65. You have to wear a mask. You have to get sprayed. You have to wear gloves, right? Uh, you have to be in an office that's disinfected thoroughly every day, et cetera. Again, I'm just giving examples analogous to what we've done at airports. You know, we, there are steps. And by the way, if you don't want to do those things, that's great. You're not allowed to go to work, right? You, you have, and by the way, right now, we have people showing up for work in the essential sectors that are doing these types of measures, right? That are doing these types of measures. So um, do you, I think you lock down, lockdowns too strong, shut down, people who are in the, um, I don't know, 75, or you have lung problems or respiratory problems or serious heart issues, and do you maybe keep them sequestered? Yeah, that's very possible. Um, I just don't think you can say everybody. And in fact, there are some immunologists that, as you know, say, gee, there is something to be said that you're not going to kill a virus. What you need to do is get... Um, in an odd way, more people safely infected. And I, you know, I'll give a, a silly example. I'm an NBA fan. I know some of you are, but I'll give a silly example. Want to go to an NBA game? Great. You get sprayed. All the employees, all the, all the workers. By the way, that'll cost some money, so your ticket will cost a bit more. Everybody has to wear gloves. Everybody has to wear a mask. If you're wearing mask, no beer sales, right? No popcorn sales. But at least it's something. And uh, the players wear them, the coaches wear them, the referees, all the fans. And somebody said to me, well, the players will never play if they have to wear a mask. They're making $10 million a year. They'll play if they have to be in ballet shoes and tutus. It's the other people. And they, of course, will work in that. So I'm not saying that is the answer. I'm just saying we're going to have to soon get more creative than just shut down. So as it relates to the, the, the bounce back, a lot of people are wondering whether this is a V, a Nike swoosh, or um, 
uh, I don't know, an L, <laughs> if you will. Um, what's your thought as it relates to how long it takes for us to get back up and running once we are on the other side of this? It all depends how long it's shut. Every day that goes by, and I'm not saying we should stop the every day that goes by, but every day that goes by, it becomes more elongated coming out business or the restaurateur who was 66 said I'm done right and somebody will eventually replace their restaurant but if they say I'm throwing in the towel because I'm 66 I was going to retire in a year or two anyway that takes longer so every day that goes by it becomes much more elongated if they could have done it in a half an hour like you reboot your your computer system um, it would have been you know, just a, a blip kind of exercise. But um, I, it's hard to answer that, Willie, until you know how long. If the speculation is it goes on, I don't know, another three weeks, another four weeks, a pretty heavy lockdown, I would say that three weeks of heavy, and this is non-statistical, I would say three weeks more of lockdown mean two to three more quarters before it rebounds. Now, well, it'll, it'll hit bottom at some point, but two to three. And if you said it's middle of May, I'd say that's going to take five to six quarters to recover from, even though it's only one more month. And it's just that the damage to the infrastructure just gets that much more. And if you were to look ahead and say, okay, at the end of the year, Dow is going to be at X and 10-year Treasury is going to be at Y. What are your bands there? Uh, if I had to bet, I'm betting strictly on some type of consensus of the medical, some type of belief on political, and I don't mean political, Democrat, Republican. It's not just us that has to make this decision. A whole lot of countries face identical challenges, right? It's not unique to us. It's not unique to our leadership, I don't think. Um, I'd say by the end of the year, Dow will be down 10% or so from where it was when it started, okay? Some number like 10% down from where it started, which would be notably up. So you have over 25,000 by the end yeah. of the year? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because it, to the extent, Willie, that there's any, you hit it when you were talking about spreads. Spreads are about uncertainty, right? Spreads are mostly about, they're about risk, but they're also about uncertainty. Spreads would narrow quickly if, quote, economically. I'm not saying because anybody's been malbehaved. We just don't know, right? So as a path is known, I think certainty will, re not certainty, uh, the uncertainty will recede a bit. And that's what's pushed things down so dramatically. It's not going to disappear, though, because whole businesses got shut down. I mean, just whole, whole businesses got shut down. Um, and it's going to take a while to get confidence rebuilt. Suppose tomorrow they opened all the airports, you're allowed to travel internationally, no, no prohibitions, et cetera you might fly and I might fly, but nobody else is going to. So it's going to take a while, even if there were no prohibitions. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd say around that number. And on 10-year treasury, um, they're going to work like hell to keep it really low, both naturally and artificially. So 10-year treasury, I had to bet, is going to be under one and a half uh, by year end. So it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna sell off between here and there because everyone has been going for the the, the risk free investment. I was I was interested that last week the ten year went from eighty basis points up to one hundred and ten, and that appeared to be everyone moving into cash. This week it appears that it's come back where people are buying ten years again, basically moving from cash back to a risk free investment. Is that a fair analysis, or is yeah, that that basically? And 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 it's how. Uh, how risk-free, but yeah, I think that's basically right, and it's the same thing. I think people will slowly move back in the market. Right now, and I don't mean at this literal minute, but for the last two weeks, it's 
it's the old statement, it's a lot easier to pick up a knife from the floor than it is catch it while it's falling. And truthfully, most of us don't need to call the bottom perfectly. I mean, it'd be lovely, but most of us don't need to call the bottom perfectly. Better to get more certainty out there, better to get more transparency of both about the medical and the uh, regulatory parts of this. Right now, it reminds me of a really good suspense movie. And you want to hit fast forward to see how it ends. But it goes a minute at a time, and you can't fast forward. For example, I'd love to know what Fetty and Fanny are going to really do, and when they're faced with challenges, how does it really happen? We don't know, right? I'd like to hit the fast forward and get there. I, you know, I said that in a funny way, it, it's like walking into a movie theater uh, right now. And on one screen is a movie uh, where everybody dies of an, an alien invasion and uh, micro bodies killing us. And it's a good movie. It's a compelling movie, right? And the other, but it's a really downer. And, and then the other one is about a society, one of these dystopia societies where mankind is collapsed and everybody is kind of like Mad Max. Everybody's just trying to survive and nobody has jobs and it's all dystopia. And you go, that's a really good movie, but it's not very much, very much fun. Which movie do you want to go to, right? That's the real challenge right now. And I'm not saying either movie, my, my gut tells me neither movie is the full story, something in between. But it does take adjusting the medical system. It does change our life approaches, and it's going to cost money. So um, during your teaching career, um, you advise lots and lots of smart people at Wharton as it relates to, okay, here you are, here's your case in front of you. Your current operations are okay, and you have some capital on the side. Right now, are you in a capital preservation mode? Are you out looking for opportunities? How, how risky, right? When do people start to deploy capital again, Peter, as it relates to, and I know you're going to say, well, it depends on how long this thing lasts for. But let's just say that there's some clarity in the next two to three weeks that we know when peak infections are going to be and we can start to see the other side. The moment that that comes out, as we saw in yesterday's market of the rebound in the equity markets, it may be too, too late. So what's your, how, do you, how do you counsel people right now as it relates to capital deployment? Well, when I'm doing that in real time with clients, um, my basic view is the following, which is nobody knows it could get worse than the immunologists are saying, it could get a lot better than the immunologists, could get worse than economists are speculating, could get a lot better. I just don't know why most of us would want to take the risk. And you say, well, by the time we see, it could be too late. Hey, I'd be so happy if by the time I recognize that the market is fully recovered, everybody's back to work, and I go, I could have bought cheap, right? I'd be happy. I could live with that world. I really could live with that world if tomorrow we wake up and the last two weeks had never happened. The market's high, everybody's healthy, all's good. And you go, huh, gee, some people made a lot of money buying at the bottom. I just don't think most of us need that. I think most of us are trying to figure out a more existential question like, do I proceed on my development project? Do I lay people off? Do I um, pay my rent? Do I pay my loan? I think they're more dealing with those. And I think those kind of are much more important in the near term. And my general advice, everybody's got unique circumstances. My general advice is um, cash is a good thing in times of uncertainty. And I, I include treasuries in cash, right? I mean, liquidity is a good thing in times of uncertainty especially. And that's my general counsel. Uh, assume your construction loan is not going to be given. Assume that if you're rolling over a loan, it's going to be very difficult. How are you going to deal with not dealing with it? Uh, assume your rental receipts are going to fall by 20%, uh, even though they've historically run a half a percent. 
I think that's the world I'd be kind of analyzing now. Because if it doesn't turn out, you'll live with it just fine. So uh, that's where I'm at. I'm going to give a, a quick anecdote as it relates to cap rates, and then I want to come back to you and your thought as it relates to where cap rates go. Um, we had a, a pretty large transaction that two weeks ago we had 15 bidders in best and final on a multifamily asset, large asset. Um, uh, the 15 went down to eight uh, who raised their bid from best and final to be in the final round. Uh, we picked a winner last week, and the winner backed out of the deal yesterday. Um, the asset was trading at a 3.9 cap rate. Uh, and if you look at some of the publicly traded multifamily REITs, this is a multifamily asset, they're all right now trading at indicative cap rates of north of six. Um, and so you sit there and you say, why would you take down an asset right now at a 3.9 cap rate when the publicly traded REITs have indicative cap rates of north of six? What's your thought as it relates to, you know, multi still has liquidity, um, and so it's, it is without a doubt, as you said in your podcast, other than manufacturing Purell and toilet paper, it's a pretty darn good place to be right now. Um, but what's your thought as it relates to cap rates and sort of price discovery over the next couple of months? Yeah, there is no price, as you know, out there right now on private assets. You just described it, right? You just described it. Um, if, and hopefully we actually go through a period where people don't have to price discover under stress. Hopefully we get forbearance so you don't get foreclosures that trigger that cycle of forced sales that set forced false prices, that set more forced sales. That So hopefully the forbearance situation will allow that to, in an odd way, not have a lot of price discovery on the private market in the next couple of months. I expect you're not going to get many transactions in the next couple of months. That's what I really expect. If you want to, quote, take advantage of the um, dislocation, it's the public market. Because you can go in and make a bet. Is it a six cap is going to a seven? Or is it six cap going down to a five? You can actually make your bet there. On the private side, I just think there's going to be very little price discovery for the next 60 days. And I think in an odd way, that's probably a good thing. Uh, I generally believe in prices. But there's enough pricing that people can do in the, uh, in the public market. There is an odd situation, and I'll, and I'll take the hotels, just for example, as an extreme. You can look at a hotel. You could look at their preferred debt, or excuse me, their preferred equity. And you'd say, well, their coverage ratio on fixed charges is uh, 1.7. Well, that's what their coverage was. What is their coverage as we speak? Well, if nobody can come to your hotels you have a really bad coverage ratio. So it's very hard to even know how to price that through. Um, and in fact, you mentioned, should they close the market? There is an argument, and I'm a big believer in free trade, but there is an argument that all you've done is, all we've done is operate a casino for the last couple of weeks in the stock market. I mean, it's not an investment market, it's a gambling market. Uh, will it be up the next 20 minutes or down the next 20 minutes, as opposed to a fundamental analysis where you think growth, you think NOI is going to grow at 2.4%, and I think it's going to grow at 2.7%, and based on that, we trade. There is an argument that it's just gambling at this point, just truly just gambling as opposed to investing. And I don't know if you want to turn the New York Stock Exchange purely into gambling. There's always a bit of that, but I don't know if that's what you want to make it. That's great. Um, I think we are almost at the bottom of the hour. And so um, a couple uh, closing thoughts. First of all, I would like to thank Peter very much for joining us. Your insight has been fantastic as, as usual. Um, the second thing is I got a, a couple things on the screen on the side as it relates to potentially using hospitality to house people rather than just uh, student housing. Um, the bottom line is the federal government needs solutions and if they say they're going to go and master lease hosp uh, hotels from Hilton or Marriott, have at it. If they say they're going to go set up makeshift dormitories using the military to build them, have at it. If they go take 
some cruise line's entire fleet and put them off the coast of the United States outside of New York and Miami and San Francisco and LA and they do that, have at it. They need to put a plan in place to take some of these, if you will, vacant assets and start putting them in place for the inflow of people that are gonna be coming into our hospitals across the country. That's all I'm saying. Not trying to say that student housing is any better than anything else. We gave them an idea um, and they're now, it appears the Army Corps of Engineers and FEMA are working along those types of plans. Um, the second thing is I've gotten a ton of questions as it relates to specificity on Fannie and Freddie's forbearance programs. Um, please reach out to your Freddie Mac Optigo lender, your Fannie Mae Dust lender, um, and talk to them. We obviously have all the information that Fannie and Freddie are giving out, and we and all of our competitor firms uh, will be as helpful as we can be to give you clarity on what the programs are, what the definitions are, and how to proceed forward. Um, and the final thing I would say is to go back to the very top of the call, which is just that um, I'm A, greatly appreciative of all of you joining us today for these. We will put another one on for next week. Um, I want to thank Peter again for taking the time uh, to join us. And um, I wish everyone a good day. Be safe and be healthy. And thanks again for joining us. Take care.